Baba shifts focus to emphasize those moments or processes that are produced in the articulation of cultural differences. These in-between spaces provide the terrain for elaborating sites of collaboration, end quote. The articulation of differences within the search for similarities is what underpins ILM's entire project, from interpreting English social mores to Indians through Victorian literature, to interpreting Indian social mores to Anglos through Indian literature. Vashuda Dalmia writes that the adoption of newer literary genres from the West, such as short stories, novels, editorials, and essays, represents the adaptation and assimilation of Western genres to the Indian tradition and situation, and participates in a larger shift in social and historical consciousness. This represents an enterprise which sought to write the autobiography of the nation a historical consciousness forged as a sense of past achievement, of new social and political awareness, and of the place of the individual within it. This incorporates three temporal considerations, antiquity, continuity, and contemporaneity at the same time." End quote. Parta Chatterjee, refines this idea by positing that the various cultural forms of Western modernity were put through a nationalist sieve and only selectively adopted. Then combined with the reconstituted elements of what was claimed to be indigenous tradition, a process designed to justify and legitimize a nationalist cultural politics so um, I want to pause for just a second here. Partha Chatterjee, that, who I've just quoted, um, and just keep your ears attuned for the end of this talk in which I'll bring in Pandita Ramabai, who argues from the same perspective. Nationalist reform through modernization is thus characterized by the selective appropriation of Western modernity in order to make modernity consistent with the nationalist project. Similarly, ILM represents more than the limitations implied by the colonial and indigenous patriarchal imperatives by which women were bound by adapting the best from the West and leaving the rest. But it also scrutinizes traditional native customs considered to oppress women, both views being central in the endeavor to uplift Mother India. The magazine neither promotes English cultural authority at the expense of traditional cultural mores, nor retreats from a candid critique of either perspective, aiming instead to synthesize and translate Indian cultural contexts through the lenses of English language and literature. Thus is the agency of Indian women to some degree enabled by applying English conceptual frameworks to the Indian woman question in capital letters, it also enables what Chatterjee terms a selectiveness that avoids change and innovation in order to preserve the status quo. My focus investigates ILM's unique editorial policy, which aims for Indian women while welcoming commentary by women and men to form a bond of union east and west, a stunningly capacious invitation to participate in a conversation that tr transcends geopolitical and sociocultural boundaries. ILM is predicated on the idea of promoting cooperative discourse between east and west, empire and colony, and on giving voice both to those who presume to speak for others and to those endeavoring to speak for themselves, many for the very first time. ILM's first run spanned 1901 to 1918, a period when patriotism to many still meant loyalty to the empire and was not yet considered inconsistent with the nationalist impulse to define an exclusionary brand of Indianness. But by 1927, its renewed publication required that Satyanaran, I didn't give you her name, but the editor's name is Kamala Satyanaran, confront a radically altered post-World War I nationalist consciousness. 
Her personal identification with Indian, English, Hindu, and Christian influences and her editorial policy of tolerance, acceptance, and cooperation were difficult to maintain and negotiate once Indian nationalism became more sharply distinguished by cultural separatism. By 1927, many felt that the time for mending social intercourse between women East and West, a central idea debated in this magazine, was past. Satyanaran wrote, I am sometimes blamed for not concentrating more on the political activities of Indian women, but since there are other papers to do that, and Sri Dharma, if you're familiar with that one, is uh, the first one that comes to mind, very, very politically oriented. My journal can enlarge upon the general aspect and upon the inward advance of Indian women and their preparation for increased responsibilities. Indian womanhood should be based not only on our ancient ideals, but also on some of the forward movements of Western nations. This emphasis distinguishes ILM from the society or fashion pages typically associated with women's journalism. Women deserve civil rights, but rights re involve responsibilities. And to assume them, women must be adequately prepared through education and critical thinking. Rights and responsibilities is central to the Swaraj Swadeshi Satyagraha nexus. By emphasizing the growth of the total personality, women's pers periodicals endeavored to cultivate elements of culture and modern living and wean them away from ignorance and gossip." Unquote. Viewed through the lens of Indian womanhood, ILM combines the primary woman question debates from the mid-Victorian period through the shocking girl of the period, that would have been around the 1880s. From the no notorious new women around the 1890s through the militant suffragettes in the early 20th century. And from women's release from Perda to their incarceration as political prisoners. This nexus of interest is linked by a concern with womanliness how the term is defined according to tradition, how it requires redefining according to the spirit of the age, how a synthesis of East and West, ancient and modern can be yoked to modernization, emancipation, and above all, the preservation, rejuvenation, and articulation of Indian identity. While such characters as Sita, Draupadi, and other classical Indian heroines were presented as amulable models, the impulse to define modern Indian womanhood is more prominently reflected in this magazine in the Victorian gender ideology promoted by Tennyson and John Ruskin. Editorially, ILM addressed English, Anglo-Indian, and Indian concerns. Ideologically, it stressed the contentious truism that woman's place is in the home the most basic commonplace linking East and West, ancient and modern. Thus, ILM's editorial platform is both predicated on and anxious about a gender ideology that was increasingly out of step with the time, resulting in an ambivalent stance uncertainly poised between the known drawbacks of traditionalism and the unknown risks of modernism. So from here, with that background, I'd like to talk about literary criticism, uh, which was um, a very predominant and primary focus in the Indian Ladies Magazine. Satyanadan's editorial platform clearly states her aims for the empowerment of Indian women, most frequently expressed through allusions to Tennyson. Quote, woman's cause is man's, they rise or sink together. This idea is especially relevant in India, where a husband is, quote, the woman's god. There is no other god for her. He may be the worst sinner and a great criminal. Still, he is her god, and she must worship him. As conceptualized by the term patyavratya, I hope I pronounced that, uh, virtuous wife, Woman's role is to toil on from day to day, never swerving from the path of mute obedience to unworthy and morally wretched husbands, divorce being permitted to men but not to women. 
As the embodiment of deathless devotion and unquestioning obedience, hers is not to reason why, hers is but to do or die. Tennyson might well marvel that his jingoistic war poem, The Charge of the Light Brigade, was used to promote Indian angel in the house ideology. ILM both stresses and contests the universal truism that woman's place is in the home from Shakespeare, a ministering angel shall my sister be in Hamlet, to Walter Scott, a woman when pain and anguish wring the brow, a ministering angel thou. And from George Eliot, the happiest women like the happiest nations have no history, to Robert Louis Stevenson, do not grasp at the stars, but do life's plain common work. Its editorial platform is both predicated on and anxious about the imperative to modernize gender ideology. Tennyson's The Princess investigates the idea that women facing ridicule for their educational ambitions can evolve intellectually and socially only by removing themselves from mixed society, a concept evocative of Perda, which was a topic that uh, came up frequently in ILM's pages. Opponents to female education claimed women are masculinized and unsexed by cerebral pursuits, rendering them socially incompatible with men, biologically unfit for childbearing, ill-suited for domesticity, and prone to mental illness. According to Tennyson's ideal of womanhood, the woman is the complement of the man. Any attempt to thwart this eternal law will be met with failure, and that includes educating women. Princess Ida is led astray by the idea of gender equality, prompting her to establish a women's college. But the poem concludes with everyone pairing up according to conventional patriarchy, the ideal of educated womanhood displaced by a vague happily ever after. Gender equality is eclipsed by a blatant inequity as in the ubiquitous woman's cause is man's. But Kamala insists that Ida has been misjudged, that women are wronged and men are deceivers. The notion that women do need separatism and isolation in order to avoid ridicule and insult while pursuing education is troubling but persuasive. In the shadow will we work and mold the women to a fuller day. Ida's commitment to sisterhood and the uplift of women employs the compelling rhetoric of sati. I'm quoting from the poem, oh, if our end were less achievable by slow approaches than by single act of immolation, any phase of death, we were as prompt to spring against the pikes or down the fiery gulf as talk of it to compass our dear sister's liberties. Kamala concludes the prince is not worthy of the princess he deserves, a, she deserves a man with a grander nature, more in touch with her own. We lose patience with him. Ida is accused of too much, her submission is too much, the prince is too condescending. Tennyson's Princess Ida, a character study, offers a far more conventional view in which the prince's behavior is unquestioned. His legal right to claim the bride in an arranged marriage contracted by their fathers in infancy aligning with Indian custom. His mercenary purpose is romanticized, to claim his lawful property and assert his conjugal rights by presenting him as devotedly in love, albeit with one he has never met, whose character he does not know, whose dreams and goals do not interest him. He is wounded, infantilized, emasculated, by Princess Ida, who is hard, proud, conceited, and wanting in womanly tenderness. Like the relentlessly maligned Rukmabai, Ida repudiates the obligations of all pre-contracts. She is irritated that men should treat women either as vassal or babes to be dawdled, and incensed that women allow themselves to be household stuff, live chattels, slaves at home, and fools abroad. She resists being passed from father to husband and condemned as disrespectful, although no critical scrutiny investigates the disrespect accorded her through her commodification by these two men. The women's college upends established social order, but once 
Ida embraces her true nature by relinquishing her dreams of female education in exchange for what every woman counts her due, marriage and motherhood, the prince's legal claims are satisfied. Princess Ida is intellectually gifted, not a man-hater of the shrieking sisterhood, but committed to social justice and grieved by entrenched indifference to female oppression. The poem accommodates everyone, new women bound to Victorian men, social progress thwarted and political status quo reinstated, gender solidarity derailed by divide and conquer, and fairy tale endings of both the utopian and dystopian varieties. A more ominous cautionary tale is provided by Tennyson's Queen Guinevere, a daughter of the gods rendered lowly by adultery. Quote, what a fall was there and what an object lesson to frail womankind. Despite the rhetoric of romance, Arthur claims Guinevere's hand from her father as a reward for his military prowess, prompting the author to admit perhaps Guinevere's consent has not been asked. In those days, as now in our India, it was not the custom to consult girls about their marriage. Whether Guinevere is a trophy wife or destiny's pawn, Arthur, Arthur sends the heartthrob and notorious ladies' man, Lancelot, to fetch her on his behalf. While she is disappointed by the substitution, she and Arthur marry and commence living happily ever after until she is again disappointed, finding him cold, high, self-contained, and passionless, distinct from my Lancelot, a man of warmth and color. When her guilty love becomes public knowledge, nothing can excuse the queen who has spoilt the purpose of Arthur's life. She falls and sins, nothing can excuse her, her fall like that of our mother Eve, causing universally destructive consequences, despite her ostensible powerlessness. Lancelot apparently is blameless, as is the lofty and remote Arthur. The object lesson is twofold. First, since no reliance can be accorded female chastity, she who prefers a man of warmth and color to rigid, frigid idealism has a great flaw in her nature. And second, she who seeks to define a life purpose of her own has the power to bring down civilization. <coughs> Condemned to a nunnery, Guinevere grovels at Arthur's feet while he urges her to embrace celibacy. Leave me this, my last hope, he says. Thus does Arthur assert his property and conjugal rights by proclaiming that her commitment to celibacy offers some measure of redemption for him being cuckolded by his best friend. Eve-like, her sin is the shame of all women, plunging the kingdom into death, darkness, and confusion. Guinevere should have kept her disappointments to herself and in true Victorian fashion, simply suffer and be still. A lesser known Tennyson poem is Dora, whose title character, quote, must be dear to our Indian ladies for proving it is not necessary to do great public deeds to be really useful in the world. A quiet home life is the noblest and most useful life. Dora's words, I would not have, the restless will that hurries to and fro, seeking for some great thing to do or secret thing to know, I would be treated as a child and guided where I go. Neither Indian nor matchmaker, her uncle determines that cousins Dora and William will marry, but William loves another and chooses romantic love over filial piety, leaving Dora to the self-renouncing love of the meek that type of womanhood sacrificed for the happiness of others, a calm fulfillment of duty, a noble self-denial. When William dies, the very timid Dora disobeys uncle by bringing William's wife and child into the household, thus facilitating reconciliation, repentance, and familial peace. Although clearly quite capable of act Acting autonomously, Dora ultimately lives only for the happiness of others, as a true angel in the house should. But an alternative interpretation highlights darker aspects of the poem. Enraged by Dora's action, Uncle casts both women out, 
homeless and lacking economic resources, they are positioned to become fallen women. The consummate angel in the house, Dora's very self-negation leads her to be rejected by William, cast out by uncle and maligned by Mary. Yet her sympathy and compassion for the sufferings of others remains unconditional. In her fidelity to William, Dora remained unmarried till her death, a metaphorical widow, hinting at contemporary widow remarriage debates. This presents a strong contrast to Mary, who took another mate. Perhaps it is not surprising that only women characters are so assessed. Although men and women are repeatedly cast as complementary parts of a whole, there is no comparable investigation of male characters, their behaviors, or their attitudes towards women. Both the princess and idols of the king feature heroines who are exchanged between men without their consent as spoils of war, political pawns, or in payment of a debt. Ida and Guinevere are condemned for resisting the indignity of losing their autonomy, and there is little attempt to comprehend their perspectives or motivations. The perpetual virgin, Dora, illustrates that fairy tale romance is predicated on the sacrifices of women who relinquish their dreams at best or expiate their sins through a living death as Guinevere um, in the nunnery. During a period associated with Indian women's awakening, this critical trend in ILM is unsettling. Given the centrality of social reforms addressing the disempowering aspects of marital practices and gender relations, and the imperative to shift those traditional priorities for the national good, the history of Indian nationalism exhibits that the exhilaration of pursuing liberty was chronically vexed by anxiety, anxiety about the consequences of actually achieving it. According to John Ruskin, the true dignity of woman is variously expressed through her Christ-like role as savior of the world, as a domesticated queen whose realm is within the garden gate, a sacred place, a vestal temple. This ignores the profound disjunction between an unabashed promotion of the Victorian angel in the house with the awakening of Indian new women actively shaping the nationalist era. <clears throat> truly is there a gender, I'm sorry, truly is there a grander teacher than Ruskin who has a higher conception of woman's place in the world. He venerates women with the devotion of a knight to his lady to which I will add truly what sort of modernizing model is so anachronistic as to predate even the discovery of the new world. <coughs> Excuse me. One author vigorously asserts that ILM's readers are not new women, they're a perversion, Thank you. and should distance themselves from Western harpies parading the streets and claiming their rights excuse me, and unsexing themselves. And this would have been around the, the, um, the campaign for the vote in England. He invokes Ruskin, urging that women be enduringly, incorruptingly good, instinctively, infallibly wise, not for self-development, but for self-renunciation. Thus is the angel in the house promoted for its compatibility with traditional in Indian separate spheres gender ideology. While its logical extension, the modern self-sufficient new woman, an active contributor to rather than a chronic drain on society, one who exhibits the qualities needed to overthrow British imperialism, is denigrated as exemplifying Western decadence, a confounding array of mixed messages to be sure. The voices of Victorian patriarchy are impressively malleable. A dream of Indian women dramatizes how women's demand for equal rights sparks a battle of the sexes. This prompts Mother India to manifest herself, weeping in distress at the discordance created by her daughter's demands for gender parity. Once both sides agree to compromise, Mother India smiles, radiant as the sun, while quoting none other than John Ruskin on separate spheres gender ideology, 
wherein man's work relates to the state and woman's to the home. But the same idea serves to underpin cultural separatism as in a comparison of the Ramayana and Mahabharata with the Iliad and the Odyssey. Indian heroines like Damayanti, Savriti, and Sita evidence the purity and happiness of domestic life in ancient India, a capacity in Hindu women for the discharge of the most sacred and most important duties in life, rendering them superior to Helen or Penelope. A more fruitful analysis might look for points of similarity as in these lines from the Mahabharata. A woman, I'm sorry, a wife is half the man, his truest friend. A loving wife is a perpetual spring of virtue, pleasure, wealth. A faithful wife is his best aid in seeking heavenly bliss. A sweetly speaking wife is a companion in solitude, a father in advice, a mother in all seasons of distress, a rest in passing through life's wilderness. Surely this critic must have been reading Ruskin Tennyson and Patmore while writing this assessment of the Mahabharata. Kamala's character analyses of Sita and Draupadi directly employ the Victorian angel and new woman frameworks. She asks what would Sita have done in the modern world? She would have hated the demand for equal divorce rights with men. She would have recognized the limitations of women, their physical weaknesses, their differences of mental and spiritual attributes from men. She would have asked women to attend to their special duties of home and children first. Sita is no speechifier like certain modern activists, um, Sarojini Naidu and Kamala Devi come to mind. She loved to work like an ordinary drudge and eschewed luxury. If Sita personifies the angel in the house, Draupadi is the new woman, chaste despite enforced polygamy and untrammeled by women's signature inferiority complex. Outspoken and opinionated, she would have loved standing on the lecture platform, putting her courage, persistence, and determination in the service of nationalism. Kamala's certainty about the analogy between Victorian ideology and India's mythical heroines evidences the surprisingly seamless consistency of her views. The sentiment extends to Indian poetesses Toru Dutt and Sarojini Naidu, both praised for applying English literary skills to Indian cultural contexts. Every patriotic Indian should be proud of Toru Dutt for accomplishing what remains undeveloped in India's daughters. But such praise provokes a seemingly inevitable caveat. Although she is passionately fond of books, she's severely incapacitated by illness. Toru Dutt was, was more importantly adept at housekeeping and did every kind of domestic work which girls should do. As for Sarojini Naidu, by the time she emerged as the poetess of modern India, the compulsion to minimize her accomplishments by allusions to housekeeping was out of fashion, and in her case, irrelevant. Naidu's reign as poetess was as short-lived as Toru Dutt's, since she very early shifted her energies away from literature and toward politics, and most emphatically not toward housekeeping. Pandita Ramabai, and here's if you'll think back now to Partha Chatterjee uh, and the, selective, the idea of selectivity. Pandita Ramabai insisted that there was no golden age for Hindu women. The myth was invented by 19th century nationalists selectively constructing great ancient traditions as a source for nationalist claims, unquote. Such modern myth-making incorporated the Victorian angel, a concept easily adaptable to the ideal of Indian womanhood as constructed by various sons of the soil. Woman's part in our national progress challenges such veneration of ancient womanhood to articulate a more realistic, practical version of modern Indian women. Let us take into account only the average woman Contemporary perceptions of women are degrading in the extreme. A woman is a slave. So long as we do not strenuously take steps to uplift them and provide them with a better social outlook, national progress is exponentially delayed. 
ILM's critical values incorporated East and West, Ancient and Modern, Angel in the House, and New Woman, resulting in an ambivalent gender ideology uncertainly poised between the known drawbacks of Victorianism and the unknown risks of modernism. During ILM's first run, the editor, contributors, and readers seemed to prefer it that way. Its second run more clearly evidenced the irreconcilable fissures dividing real from ideal and ancient from modern when confronted with the stark realities demanded by independence and national autonomy in the modern globalized era. Thank you. इसमें सबसे पहले मैं पेपर प्रेजेंट करने की दावत देता हूं मोहतरमा असमा रशीद और आपका मौजू है इंटरसेक्शंस उर्दू दकनी एंड नजमा निखत जनाब मोहतरमा असमा रशीद गुड आफ्टरनून द टाइटल ऑफ द पेपर इज इंटरसेक्शंस दकनी उर्दू एंड नजमा निखत बट आल्सो अ क्वेश्चन ऑफ आइडेंटिटीज दैट आई एम इंटरेस्टेड इन वाया लैंग्वेज ऑल राइट लेट मी रीड एंड देन पर Yeah, so a systematic comprehension of a language in terms of grammar and meaning is usually understood as a basis for further education, though it can also be a foundation for doing other things with the language later on. This shift from learning languages in use as a byproduct of formal learning, reading, writing, memorizing, writing accounts, etc., to learning languages as discrete and separate objects has been tracked to colonial times. Um, for example, uh, the, the, the formation of uh, or the transition from pundits, small v's, etc., to teachers, formal teachers, uh, to uh, the printing and publishing of primers in textbooks uh, for learning languages, etc. It also involves a shift within educational practices in the attention to and intervention in language. What this also meant is that language provided a medium for the acquisition of knowledge, as has been said earlier today, as well as a marker of cultural identification. And this is something which will grow over time. Translation activities in terms of pre-British colonial and nationalist interventions are well documented, and I'm going to skip no further regurgitation here. The gradual shaping of Urdu uh, from the, uh, in, in Manu, I don't need to talk about Wali Muhammad, Wali Dakhani, etc. But from there, around the turn of the 18th century to its apogee, if you like, into a sophisticated literary and revolutionary language of late 19th, 20th century Delhi is also well known. While Urdu gained a hegemonic status in its literary world of the subcontinent's northern regions in the 19th century, to the south in Hyderabad state, it was largely in the language of the Gair Mulkis or the non-locals, the aristocratic elite and the powerfully a politically powerful classes. The language of the populace, the mulkis or the locals, was Dakhani. Not surprisingly, over time, it is at best regarded as a dialect and at worst simply looked down upon. Uh, the paper is interested in the porous linguistic borders between Urdu and Dakhani, marked as it is by socio-cultural hierarchies. When a text from Dakhani is translated, for instance, into English, its life is hardly any different from any other text in Urdu. Sorry, from Urdu. This may have parallels in various other linguistic contexts. However, the crossings of Dakhani into Urdu, even as the Dakhani continued to live elsewhere, calls for a careful analysis, and this is my argument, in terms of the socio-political biography of this language and its literature. The descriptors for Dakhani as rusty, rustic, provincial, or even gibberish vis-a-vis -vis Urdu, spoken by an uncouth and uncivilized mass, appear to stand in for mask, a very distinctive imagination of a community and a culture. How do we understand this distinctive imagination of a community and a culture in translation? Uh, I have about two or three sections in the rest of my paper, one which looks at some of the recent takes on the history of Hyderabad and the emergence of Urdu in Hyderabad state as a language of administration as well as an elite socio-cultural literacy. It will then attempt to explore a Dakhani imagination through a close reading of some of the work of a relatively little known Hyderabadi writer, Najma Nikhat. Uh, her work in Urdu, set largely in Hyderabad of the 1950s, engages with the socio-cultural upheaval and through it the political and economic turmoil of the time. 
the paper aims or the attempt is to uh, read a uh, twofold reading of Najma's writings. One, it will try to tease through the writings an instance of Dakini that questions the notion of Urdu as a major minor marker of a community. Two, it will examine how the specific critique of the socio-political events of the time in her writings unfold its concerns framework of a bureaucrat intellectual and he calls them, he says that they are characterized by knowledge of putatively modern statecraft techniques awareness of global trends political savvy and connections and finely honed polyglot skills and the idea of a muslim internationalist circuit that enabled transnational connections to frame his discussion on political change uh, my concern is less with the rest of his uh, ideas, but more with these bureaucrat intellectuals, who in his analyses were critical agents who mediated established idioms, ranging from political languages linked to earlier rule of Urdu Hindi were used at the lower level of the administrations. These local languages may have been referred to as Hindui or Hindi, that is the language of Hind, but according to uh, Mustafa Kamal, a renowned linguist, this does not necessarily mean that one of them was the ancestor of Urdu. Interestingly, Hyderabad city was prominent, uh, prominently, it has been argued, Dakani speaking. So how does the shift from Persian to Urdu? Persian was an essential part of the identity of cultural elites, the old mulki nobility, which followed a Mughal system of administration and was indeed a marker of their elite status and of political domination. But one of the important aspects of this shift involves the tension between the local Dakani speaking Sunni inhabitants of Hyderabad called the Mulkis, skilled at that specialized earlier Mughal language of administration, Persian, and the modern Urdu speaking largely Shia Muslims of North India who migrated to the south, who were called the Ghair no Mulkis. The old Hyderabadi officials had an advantage as long as Persian remained the state's official language. The shift to Urdu had implications, uh, as we can uh, all, all uh, recognize, in administrative recruitment. So these new Ghair Mulki administrators, academics, and high officials, having been schooled into Urdu since a few decades earlier, facing unemployment in the north, they, make, they have an investment, if you like, in promoting Urdu for ad administrative purposes. The definition of uh, what was a mulki or a ghair mulki was also the subject of a lot of political uh, negotiation. Uh, for instance, at one point of time, if you had lived here for 20 years, uh, then you were a uh, mulki. Later, it, after some negotiation, it became 50 years and so on and so forth. So the pro-Urdu pro campaign also worked to efface the use of local languages, including Dakni. Uh, Right. So these shifts in terms of language and educational policies in the particular context of Hyderabad state when English increasingly takes over from Persian via Urdu as a medium of instruction, as knowledge, has been linked to the political failure of Hyderabad state to capitalize on a strong mulki cultural nationalism as well as to its political decimation. Let me, since I think I've used up 10 minutes, my last five minutes, I'll try to go over uh, this writer called Najma Nikhat, who was uh, around 1936. She was born around 1936, and she died, I think, in 1997. Um, she, this is a person who was born in a household, in a traditional household, constantly filled with relatives. She was, her birth name, if you like, was Jilani Begum. And at some point, as a, as a young te a teenager, she, she, changed, she decided to change her own name, and her name became Najma Nikat. So you can see that's a precocious teenager who's being uh, uh, taking shape. Uh, quite soon, she dropped out of school after her father repeatedly forgot to pay her fees. She later completed her high school privately. In the intellectual milieu of the 40s and the 50s, not surprisingly, Najma was drawn to the Communist Party, even when she was as young as 14 or 15, to left leanings. Um, when she got married in 1953, she left uh, the party, that was the rule. She married against her father's wishes, uh, a distant relative called uh, Ahmad Hussain Kidwai. Um, anyway, so she, uh, the idea of giving this biographical information in the paper was to Dakini, I think, does not get the same respect as Urdu gets in the North. In spite of the fact that Dakini is a product of, you know, assimilation from the local languages, while the Urdu of the North is an assimilated product of foreign languages. So don't you think it would be more appropriate to make Dakini the central... Sarabjit Garcha, Mr. Sarabjit Garcha, 
आपका टॉपिक है द पैशंस एंड ऑब्सेशंस ऑफ पोस्ट 1990 मराठी एंड हिंदी पोएट्री गुड आफ्टरनून फ्रेंड्स द टाइटल ऑफ द पेपर इज द पैशंस एंड ऑब्सेशंस ऑफ पोस्ट 1990 मराठी एंड हिंदी पोएट्री द ईयर 1990 इज पर्टिनेंट हियर एंड देयर इज अ स्टोरी बिहाइंड इट uh this paper presents a brief summary of a two year long study uh, that i conducted a comparative study in post 1990 marathi and hindi poetry uh in the study an attempt to create an area of focus uh, for post 1990 that is navadotri marathi and hindi poetry was made uh by keeping in trend the view of uh, post modernism with respect to key aspects like sensibility expression language and style uh, for this 10 uh, poets from marathi and 10 poets for hindi were taken into account although i'll not be discussing all of them here behind this choice uh, please note that there was no intention to make a list of must read poets in the two languages the 10 marathi poets uh, are salil wag mangesh narayan rao kale sachin ketkar shridhar telwe hemant devte manya joshi manoj surendra pathak Dinkar Manwar, Kavita Mahajan, and Arun Kale, and the ten Hindi poets are Devi Prasad Mishra, Kumar Ambuj, Katyayani, Anamika, Vimal Kumar, Badri Narayan, Ekant Shrivastav, Nilesh Raghuvanshi, Pankaj Chaturvedi, and Anita Varma. The paper discusses a few of these poets, uh, taking a cue from Sathotari. The word is important. Sathotari. means post 1960 this word is applicable both in hindi and uh, marathi and it is used in both the languages at least as far as nomenclature is concerned uh, marathi poets christened it navadotri that is post 1990 poetry but there is no such single word adjective in hindi uh, for convenience however the marathi adjective can be extended to hindi poetry as well so i'll begin with navadotri marathi poetry by taking you see direct examples from the poems of a few poets uh, i would like to begin uh, begin this discussion by a poem uh, from salil wag's collection nevadak kavita that is selected poems uh, although it was shridhar tilve uh, who was the first one to register a definitive uh, departure from erstwhile poetic trends the title of salil wag's collection is nevadak kavita and the title of this poem is zero i think what you will see two sentences in this poems poem every one of us has seen it have every one of us has come across this sentence in the first printouts we must have taken around 1990 don't try to read this or make sense of it this is a dummy copy so these two sentences are repeated you see with different line breaks and this poem although is it it's in english it's been written in devnagari and what is interesting is the translator has uh, sachin ketkar translated it into english and used all caps for the poems uh, it appears that in this poem uh, the poet wrote a kind of terms and apply uh, terms and conditions apply kind of paragraph uh, for the poems that would follow perhaps uh, through this omnipresent omnipresent disclaimer the poet is also saying that whatever you you read in this collection is only a draft of his poetry so the style is reminiscent of dadaism the avant-garde movement which began in zurich switzerland around 1960 and flourished in paris after 1920 uh, and the same pattern was followed in the last poem of the collection he begins the title uh, the most of the poems in the uh, in the collection are unnumbered uh, uh, untitled but the counting begins from zero uh maybe uh, maybe it refers to met metaphysical vocabulary there are a massive museum of forgotten items that we haven't visited for decades maybe if we talk about human consciousness even centuries besides uh, does the sun fall out of repair it might be dimming away and might burn one day burn out one day but this uh, thing about it's being out of order is untenable now let us consider these lines again from sachin ketkar I worship the screw driver that grew up drinking the milk made from the milk powder made of Trigress's milk a screw driver that grew up drinking milk 
and that too made from milk powder, in turn made of tigress's milk. Obviously, the screwdriver must be courageous. On another note, his poem on the elephant uh, definitely evokes emotion, and the lines go as follows. Overcome with compassion, I compare your colossal, wrinkled hulk with the fluid roundness of your disconsolate eyes. He then satirizes human greed and selfishness. We think we have made your amiable, proud self into a mere impoverished device for beggars. Quickly coming to Hindi poetry, I'm using the same adjective for it, Navadottari Hindi Poetry. The December 2012 issue of the Hindi literary magazine Vagarth focused on the defining characteristics of the most uh, important poets that emerged after 1980. A number of poet critics contributed to the issue. After Sathotari poetry, the poetry that managed to give itself a new identity in Hindi was the poetry of the 1980s. The most prominent Hindi poets to emerge during this period are Arun Kamal, Alok Dhanwa, Rajesh Joshi, Manglesh Dabral, Viren Dangwal, Gyanendra Pati, Venu Gopal, Ritu Raj, Asad Zaidi, Uday Prakash, and so forth. Uh, in the introduction to his book of selected poems in English translation, this number does not exist. Manglesh Dabral writes, My generation has also been fortunate because many poets who had played a vital role in shaping modern Hindi poetry and its conscience were quite active at that time. There were poets like Shamsher Bahadur Singh, Nagarjun, Trilochan, Agge, Kedarnath, Agrawal, and after them, Raghuveer Sahai, Kumar Narayan, Sarveshwar Dayal Saxena, and Dhumil, to name a few. A very good afternoon, I would say. But first of all, before going through my presentation, I would like to pay the words of thanks to the Cesario Collective Society and CART Osmania University, Hyderabad, and of course, our host university, that's Manu. Okay. Now, first of all, I would like to make one thing clear that I have restricted my topic that is, you know, entitled a study, not comparative study, because what I found is less amount of similarity than dissimilarity. So I restricted my study uh, as a study of select translated poems of Alama Iqbal. So, anyways, and first of all, I, the, I would like to give you the gist of my, you know, topic. Uh, the, first, uh, um, the first thing that I include, that is the introduction. Then I deal with the Payami Subha, that's the message of Don and the faithful translation. Uh, then I include one more poem because I have included two poems uh, by Alama Iqbal. And the one that I you know, mentioned, the other one is Aklo Dil, that is reason and heart and the faithful translation. So I have uh, taken the translated version of M.A.K. Uh, Khalil, you know, who has written Bangi Dara, that is the, you know, the marching of the bell. That's the collection of uh, poems of Alama Iqbal. So first of all, I would like to, you know, go through the introduction. I would read it out before you. Dr. Sir Muhammad Iqbal, the poet, Philosopher, scholar, barrister is regarded as one of the important, in, important figures in the Odu literature. He is praised all, all over the world for his great contribution to the Odu literature. He is considered to be a great Muslim thinker of the 20th century. Iqbal is crowned as the poet of, poet of East. He has authored many books like Secrets of the Self, Secrets of the Selfishness, Message from the East, Persian Psalms, The Call of the Marching Bells, Jabril's Wing, The Road of Moses, and The Gift from Hejaz. Uh, now, I would like to say something about his work. The works of Alama Iqbal mostly deal with the spiritual aspect of man and also with the progress of human society. So his works are generally the result of his experiences from his journeys to Europe and the Middle East. Iqbal was deeply influenced by the great philosophers like Friedrich Nietzsche, Henry Bergson, and Goethe. He considered Maulana Rumi as his uh, spiritual guide and was profoundly influenced by the poetry and philosophy of Maulana Rumi. Iqbal started focusing on the study of Islam, its culture, the history of Islamic civilization, while acknowledging Rumi as his master. 
His contributions are mostly, his uh, poetic works are mostly written in Persian, and Odu, his poetic collection, the asrar e khudi that is the secrets of the self, deals with the concept of khudi, that is, you know, that we translate as uh, self. But that has a kind of a similarity with uh, Quran as well as the Holy Quran because it has been his inspiration and that's why it's a kind of a divine thing that you can think which is present in every human being. Now, I would like to directly come to the poem but before going to the poem I would like to read out one couplet in Urdu before you so that you could understand the translation that was made by M.A.K. Khalil and whether he has been able to do justice or being faithful to the translation uh, of the two poems. So the first couplet is, that's in Urdu, Ujala jab hua rukhsat e jabeen e shab ki afshan ka naseem e zindagi lai subh e khanda ka. You know, this poem is like a picture of the daybreak and that was written by an American poet that is Longfellow, that is a very swift, Amer that's an American poet, a famous American for Longfellow. And he's almost indebted uh, in writing this poem to Longfellow. And even it is an adaptation of the daybreak uh, that was written by American poet, as I said. So it is one of the poems of the poetic collection, The Marching of the Bell, translated, it is, it is translated by M.A.K. Khalil. Now what Khalil has tried to do with the translation, he has tried to maintain the maximum precision or the equivalence while translating this poem without losing any essence and the originality of the poem. Now, the poem starts with the poem that I read it out before you, I would like to. Ujala jab hua rukhsat e jabeen e shab ki afshan ka naseem e zindagi paigham lai subh e khanda ka. When we translate, rather when Khalil translated, he translated it as, when the sparkling of the night's forehead is decoration disappeared, the zephyr of life with the news of the happy morning appeared. Now here, I have focused upon, you know, when he uses the knight's forehead decoration, that is, you know, uh, to equal to the Urdu equivalent, that is Urdu equivalent, Jabine Shab Shab Ki Afsha. That is in close proximity to it. And even it keeps the essence of the poem lion. But in the second line of the, this sentence, the poet used the equivalent as Zephyr of Life. When we try to understand the, you know, Zephyr awaked the nightingale of the flowery song in its nest. It shook the shoulder of the foam farmer on the field's edge. Now, in this couplet, the poet, or rather I would say Khalil, the translator, uses nightingale of flowery song to bulbule rangi nawa. Now, which seems uh, again here, now he, it's, an, it's a perfect equivalent in the sense or in keeping the originality are the essence of the poem. And in the third couplet, when we move to the third couplet, the poet says that the night breaks the magic of the night's darkness with the power of Surah Al-Nur. Now we have to understand why does he refer to the Surah Nur. You know, that's a surah in the Holy Quran. And if we have to understand the crux of this, that very surah, Nur means light. And if we have to read out the translation of one poem that makes us able to understand or gives us a position to understand the surah that is that the light is the nearest approach to the absolute and so you may understand it from that that you know may help you to understand the help yeah, surah nur if you might not have gone through that now here khalil uses til sami zulmati shab surah wa nur that means he, what, when he translates, he translates as sad, dark nepas, the darkness of night's talisman with Surah Nur. Now, again, here it doesn't lose the essence because he comes with the proper equivalent word that is darkness of the night's talisman. Though he could have gone for, for the other synonyms, but he doesn't go here. He, you know, keeps the structure, even he maintains the structure of the in proper structure of the poem as well. Along with some Qasi scholars, leading to the first publication of the Bible in the year 1899, the Welsh uh, Presbyterian Mission established their printing press in Cherrapunji in 1861. This printing press initially printed mission and government books. However, after the, after the year 1871, it only catered to the government books. In the first half of the 19th century, most of the books deeply conveyed the message of Christianity, even though some 
did have a slight secular bent of mind. These were mostly educational in purpose and overall had Christian values embedded in them. It was only in the latter part of the 19th century that more secular texts started coming out where not only the missionaries but also the local Khasi started writing and printing books. The latter part of the 19th century saw the embryonic beginning of translation in Khasi literature. Even though the missionaries had some Khasi scholars and some Khasi scholars had tried translating some texts from different languages, yet one cannot deny the fact that this was only the beginning of translation for the Khasi scholars, as most of the translated texts were limited to excerpts and adaptations. Translation played an important role in the building of the British Empire. As Niranjana says in her article titled Translation, Colonialism and the Rise of English, that translation participates in the fixing of colonized cultures, making them seem static and unchanging. Translation is also used in different kinds of discourses, be it missionary writing, historiography, or education in, per in perpetuating colonial domination. It also produces strategies of containment, that is, by employing certain modes of representing the other. It reinforces hegemonic versions of the colonized. The same logic can be applied to the missionary translations of the late 19th century Khasi Hills. Clearly, the missionaries and the colonizers used translation in reaching their goal. One of the eminent missionary writer, John Roberts, translated many Christian and secular books during the 19th century. While some of his books included translated excerpts that were religious in nature, yet some of them were also secular. His books titled Khasi um, Third Reader and Khasi Fourth Reader included translated excerpts from William Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, Longfellow's poem titled A Psalm of Life, Joseph Addison's A Vision of Mirza. The underlying message that he probably wanted to pass through these stories was that of having a good morality in everyday life. These texts stressed on the nurturing of moralistic values amongst the Khasis. His writing also focused characters uh, like Moses, Adam, and Abraham. He wanted to set a good example to the Khasis, mostly the youngsters, young students, and to instill in them the understanding of the concept of sin and heaven. Therefore, along with the purpose of moral growth, the themes of his writing, for most part, are religious in nature. Time and again, the missionaries felt the need to introduce and enforce Christianity to the Khasis, who were practitioners of the indigenous religion. As Clive Whitehead, in his essay titled The Contribution of the Christian Missions to British Colonial Education, suggests that the missionaries had this sagacity of missionary impulse, which is uh, the great sense of pity for those who lived in ignorance of the blessings of the gospel. This impulse drove men and women, regardless of their own welfare, to spread the word of God to the far ends of the world. It is the same impulse that made them introduce religious texts in the schools run by the missionaries, which caused a lot of discontentment amongst the Khasis. This impulse, however, selfless as it seemed, caused a sense of discontentment among the Khasis. Besides the curriculum of these schools, what angered the Khasis more was Dr. Robert's speech at Oswestry in England, where he said, as printed in the British Anglo-Indian 50 Years Report in 1902, we make no distinction between the day school and the Sunday school. The only difference is seeing that our education is that of the nature I have pointed out, that we have a Sunday school not on one day, but on seven days of the week. This clearly showed the true underlying principles of the missionaries who were mostly driven by the need to convert the natives. It was this desire for proselytization that led to the attempts of translating the Bible into Khasi language. Translation, however, is also a site of negotiation and resistance, or as Niranjana refers to, the translation both shapes and takes shape within the asymmetrical relations of power and operate under colonialism. Along with the various missionaries' activities in the late 19th century, this particular period of time also saw the emergence of the Khasi intelligentsia, the, established of the establishment of the Re Khasi Press by Jibon Roy in 1896 further, helped in the printing of more Khasi books and pamphlets that were more secular in nature. He was a well-educated Khasi writer who published many works of translation. Besides contribution to the um, uh, documentation of the Khasi religion, he is also known for the publication of books like Kakitap Chetanya, which is an adaptation from Mahabharata, Buddha Dep Charitra, which talks about the life of Buddha, Roy, being one of the enlightened Khasis, was a strong believer in the cultural and religious awakening movement. He was of the view that one should go back to one's roots, protect, and be a spokesman for one's religion and culture. As a firm believer in the Khasi indigenous religion, he also believed in strengthening the relationship of the Khasis with the rest of India. 
He was of the opinion that the Khasis should not be closed-minded and that they should try to learn about the culture and religion of the rest of India through cultural texts. It was with this intention in mind that Jibon Roy translated many texts relating to mainstream Indian culture and Hinduism. The establishment of the printing press also saw the emergence of a new kind of writing, which was more journalistic in nature and attitude. The, uh, the one common character that these journalistic writings had was the spirit of cultural awakening. In the words of Barre, the writers departed from the approach and style of the early writers. They sought to provide indigenous thought to their writings and preserve their own background against the new transition. The two periodicals titled Ukhasimanta, started by H. Dengdo and Unong Pira, started by S. C. Roy, are two such examples of journalistic writings. These periodicals published uh, translated excerpts from P. R. T. Gordon's book titled The Khasis. Gordon's book was a more or less anthropological work of the Khasi community. Even though his book was well appreciated by the British and the missionaries, yet it caused abroad uh, amongst the Khasis. The Khasis were deeply offended by this description of them. They looked at his views as an insult on the Khasi community as a whole. Therefore, they felt the need to respond to his writings. The Khasis responded to his statement of the Khasis being a tribe that worshipped their ancestors. According to, the, to him, the Khasis worshipped their great maternal uncle, great grandmother, and great grandfather. However, the Khasis deferred to his uh, views and ideas. They argued that the Khasis do not worship their ancestors or feel the need to confess their sins to them, which is against the very nature of Khasi religion. Instead, they believe in the existence of one God who is the creator of the world. They also stressed on the importance of prayer within oneself and remembering him all the time as a form of worshipping their God instead of performing several sacrifices for the same. Uh, Gordon's view, in a way, is an example of Syed's concept of Orientalism, which says that the reason the Occident gave when they went to the Orient land was that so that they could civilize them. However, that was just an, a misinterpretation of the culture of the East and only implicit justifications for the colonial and imperial ambitions of the Occident. Gordon's viewpoints are in a way, if I may say, a summation of the views of most colonizers in a colonial setting. The colonial conception of identity and that of the indigenous people are very different. This colonial conception of identity is based on the ideology of hierarchy and supremacy. It is also based on the model of the colonizer's homeland. Gordon, an administrator, like all col colonizers, has, has sculpted a monument of his homeland in opposition to the colony, or in this case, the Khasi Hills. This picture is not only limited to the landscape, but also includes um, English uh, morals, habits, and way of life. The above description also paints a certain image of the Khasis, which is that of the wretched soul. There is a certain kind of devaluation that extends to everything that concerns the natives' Khasis. Uh, the Khasis, like most communities in India, also believe in their identity, that their identity is reflected in their culture. A Khasi's identity is closely related to his or her practice of faith or, or religion, which is, in this case, the Khasi religion. The Khasis have their own sense of identity with reference to themselves and to the Khasi community as a whole. The Khasis, being a close tribal community, are much more attached to their community. Culture is defined as the way of life, especially general customs and beliefs of a certain, of a particular people. Therefore, cultural identity can be understood uh, as the identity of a group of an individual as far as one is influenced by one's belongings to a group or culture. Anthony P. Cohen, in his article, Culture as Identity, uh, is of the view that culture is something that we make and make sense of ourselves, clearly. What he meant was that one's identity is deeply embedded in one's cultures, culture. Cohen um, further says that the representation of this kind of identity, however, is only possible by a series of symbols that marks the culture and identity of the person. The problem with Dr. Robert's statements, his accusations, was that he failed to understand the culture and religion of the Khasis. Perhaps the problem here is more ideological and stems from the difference between the conceptions of Christianity and indigenous religion, or in this case, the Khasi religion. The Christian's conception of God is different from the indigenous believer. They could not grasp the idea of indigenous beliefs. Memi, in his book, The Colonizer and the Colonized, talks about how the colonizer was preoccupied with making the colonized natives undergo an urgent change instead of accepting him or her the way they are. This failure to move beyond the stereotypical concept of protectorate is visible even in the relationships between the missionaries and the Khasis. 
In all of Dr. Roberts' statements about the Khasis, all points towards how backward and devoid, the conscience, devoid of conscience they are. Now, and even, uh, even the space where they are performing. And in the case of Dasan Goy recently, I can um, explain uh, you better because uh, uh, how they, Mahmoud Faruqi and his team, they are, where, they are performing in very uh, famous amphitheater and their uh, forefront audience is very classy type. But, uh, um, but their uh, audio or visual uh, video available on YouTube and uh, those uh, who, are non, who can't go there, because of the ticket tradition, as I mentioned in the paper, because uh, uh, even I was trying to go, but because of the ticket, I cancelled because it was 500 rupees in Hyderabad. So uh, I, I think uh, there are uh, means their translation in Hindi uh, Devanagari uh, uh, text that is also a means uh, medium to reach uh, people in different uh, section of the people. Those they can't go, but they can read their performance in a script. Even in Bengali, that is a fiction one that uh, I, because of that lack of time, I couldn't mention so many things. I just grabbed that one. So I, I think uh, I try to give, uh, I, I can explain you better, sir, after this. Thank you, sir. I will give all the paper presenters to my heart. First of all, Asma Rashid, who has written the story नजमा निखत के स्टोरीज के हवाले से हैदराबाद की पूरी फार्मर जो स्टेट थी उसके कल्चरल उसकी तहजीब सकाफत दक्षिणी ज़बान वगैरह पर तफसील से उफ़तू की बहुत अच्छा पेपर लिखा आपने आपको बारे बात देता हूँ उसके बाद मिस्टर सरबजीत गार्चा जिन्होंने 1990 के बाद की मराठी और हिंदी शायरी पर उफ़तू की हिंदी शाय थोड़ा सा उसका भी आप वर्णन कर देते, थोड़ा सा उसको भी डिस्क्राइब करते, तो मैं समझता हूँ और अच्छा होता। अल्लाह मायकबाल के ट्रांसलेशंस पर बात की, सायर अहमद मीर ने उस पर मज़ेद गुफ्तों की जा सकती है और तफसील से और आखिर में इशरत जहाँ ने दास्तान पर बात की, मैं तेलंगाने का रहने वाला और इवन जो बेगर्स हैं, जो चटाई बुनते हैं, मैट्स बुनते हैं, मैट्स बनाते हैं, वो मैट्स बनाने के लिए आते हैं, लेकिन कथा बोलते हैं तेलगु में। तो इतना बहुत ज़्यादा यहाँ पर पापुलर है, पापुलर रहा है कथा का ट्रेडिशन। तो लेकिन उर्दू में इस रीज़न में नहीं रहा। तो ये पहली उर्दू में पर परफॉर्मेंस आर्ट रहा दास्तान गोई का वो पाकिस्तान में तो एक एरिया है उसका नाम ही है उर्दू दास्तान बाजार खिस्सा खानी बाजार खिस्सा खानी बाजार तो खिस्सा खानी बाजार में स्ट्राइक भी हुई थी इंडिपेंडेंस से पहले वहाँ पे गोली भी चलाई गई थी अंग्रेजों के अगेंस्ट में जो दक्कन में कम था इसका ट्रेडिशन इसके जरिए से शुरू हुआ है तो बहरहाल मैं शुक्रिया अदा करता हूँ ओस्मान सिटी मानो और कैजुराय का कि उन्होंने मुझे ये मौका दिया बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया थैंक यू एंड एन इमेजिनेटिव लैंग्वेज प्रोजेक्ट व्हिच इज फंडेड बाय द एएचआरसी व्हिच इज इन इन यूके इज द आर्ट्स um, and uh, this project very broadly seeks to explore the languages um, and cinema, the relationship between languages and cinema, and specifically respond to questions regarding um, the role of languages and translation practices, specifically in dubbing and subtitling of popular Hindi cinema in Europe. Uh, some peripheral literature addressed the permeability of English and American accent in uh, Bollywood films, while um, somehow less attention has been given to the development of cultural links uh, between Europe and the popular Hindi cinema industry that have been uh, somehow have been recorded so far. So this somehow gave us the push to actually think, right, there is some work that needs to be done. Uh, this research also grows under the elegy of the now formalized Euro Bollywood Research Network, um, a network of academics across uh, UK and, uh, and Europe, really, 
uh, which brings together all of us to widely reflect on Bollywood in Europe and Europe in Bollywood. It is important to acknowledge that uh, multilingual Euro Bollywood is a pilot project. Um, it, it literally it just started at the beginning of October. And it is a collaboration between the Montfort University, the University of Vienna, and Eftos Laurent University in Budapest. Uh, multilingual Euro Bollywood, in a nutshell, is a project that intends to map out the nuances of cultural transfer from Bollywood to Europe through the study of the practices of subtitling and dubbing and their role in restating um, hegemonic cultural implication or forms of, um, of intercultural metissage. The broad idea is to explore how historical, sociocultural and conceptual question of Euro-Bollywood's creative relationship is further, um, is further uh, problematized or resolved by multilingual dynamics. Thus, the, uh, the overall aim is to shed light on the linguistic dimension of Euro-Bollywood and address in details, uh, for instance, narrative about multilingualism, um, the social practices of creating and understanding transnational Hindi uh, language, and investigate ideas of foreignness, a notion much uh, ingrained um, in my overall research. Via mimicry, via attention to the acoustic and phonetic uh, stereotyping, by revealing accents, for instance, or multiple accents. The research aim uh, and objective of this project are driven by um, uh, the profound impact of multilingualism on uh, uh, transnational and accented cinema. However, research on the impact of multilingualism in, uh, um, in uh, transnational Bollywood in Europe is not available yet. Thus, this project wants to be a real and concrete intervention uh, in this field and seeks to address how such linguistic elements and specifically how subtitling and dubbing are possibly barriers, are gateways, and more widely identity markers to reimagine Bollywood's cinematic culture in Europe. Now, um, the globalization of Bollywood cinema is a well-established phenomenon. Literature in the past few years um, and a variety also of international PhD research have engaged through a, through a, a series of theoretical and historical frame uh, to look at the production, reception, and circulation, to mention a few uh, of um, Bollywood in, uh, um, in, uh, in, within the global context, and have highlighted the emergence of global spaces for cultural production, and have enabled a variety of reflection on how is Bollywood cinema received worldwide, how it is experienced, where it is viewed along with the broader consideration of cultural and social permeability of this industry outside the country of origins. However, the scholarly domain has neglected um, the linguistic or rather multilingual dimension that such films have had, um, have had in, the, in the past few years while becoming available though to the large audience. So multilingualism uh, in India has to be mentioned. Um, that um, it's something, it's a phenomenon that happens naturally across a variety of the so-called regional cinema, which is common. It is something that um, uh, happens through subtitles, to dubbing, and to stretch it even further to adaptation from one regional film into another regional film. Now, today, the type of multilingualism studied, and of which I would like to, as I say, throw some ideas, is the one of popular Hindi cinema abroad to investigate um, how cultural transfer operates to, to have a clear, um, actually operates, and what does it suggest in uh, this uh, wide umbrella of uh, translation studies. So allow me a diversion. Um, thanks. Allow me a diversion here. Um, during my uh, recent trip to the National Film Archive in Pune, I came across um, on, my, on my final day there, uh, almost as a, uh, really, it was helping me to, to shape this paper today. Uh, I came across the document titled Indian Talkie 1931-1951, Silver Jubilee Souvenir. 
It was edited by the Film Federation of India in 1956, and the document interestingly um, stated that uh, the, the first barrier to an Indian film that comes in the way of its smooth travel to the Western countries would appear to be the language. Strangely enough, this is not a real barrier anymore. For, it, um, um, for if it were so, the success abroad of Japanese and Italian films would have a similar handicap, could not well be justified. The language problem existed only before the war, but was later dismissed to a greater extent by the wartime. Necessity of having to spread a small volume of film production over a large part of the world. Most of the films affected thus were either European or American, and they had each to be transformed into the language of the other by the most econom economical manner. This, stand, uh, this um, uh, started the trend towards economical um, subtitling and dubbing, which has now become a well-established method for uh, foreign film exploration, um, exploitation sorry, uh, throughout the Western Hemisphere. The problem of language does not therefore seem to be the one that affects our place um, uh, on the world film map. There is another problem, however, closely related to language, which causes the most significant barrier to our films abroad, and that is the method of expression. By this, is, uh, by this is meant not only the gesture and movement of our artists, but also the entire psychological approach to the construction of scenes and themes in our film. So very interestingly, actually, this, uh, um, this document traces what then informs uh, most of the, the literature on, uh, a lot of the literature, the one that I could chart until now, on uh, uh, dubbing and, uh, and subtitling and how it actually works so in, uh, in the audiovisual production. <clears throat> um, to mention, uh, could we change slide? Yeah. Uh, to mention uh, one of the authors I'm engaging with, uh, Carol O'Sullivan in translation, um, translating popular culture, reminds us in, the work, in her work that the tradition of foreign languages in cinema and the study of it is changing, showing um, how a diverse range of device and narrative uh, conventions, um, different conventions, have evolved to represent and translate foreign language for cinema audience, audiences. Devices such as translating dissolve, uh, the ludic subtitle, used in films since the silent era are studied in light of cinema's mission to tell stories about characters that do not share the same language with the audience. <clears throat> now, the scholarly literature on dubbing and subtitling has produced a body of knowledge that included reflection on evaluating um, uh, problems connected also to technical aspects. Uh, of dubbing and subtitling. A lot of uh, attention has been given to timing, to synchronicity, of course, to notion of narrative as well, um, and also to the complexity connected to authenticity, something that I would not go into, into detail today, to originality to the text. However, these approaches, while being all valid and, and interesting ways of uncovering the complexities of dubbing and subtitling, approaches keen to respond what, I, what is left, what is lost in such translation, they engage much less <clears throat> with, social, with the social frames, um, which is crucial, I believe, to reframe what we mean foreignness in audiovisual uh, material. Could we change slide? So, in this light, uh, the the initial work that I intend to do this with this project is to um, is to cover is to look at production modes, not much in terms of really translation as in, in pure terms, because it's it's an area I'm not familiar with. Um, hence, I would like to shift from pure linguistic uh, translation to linguistic transfer of film content into another and understand this kind of migration of contents under the umbrella of cultural transfer studies. Uh, hence, I'm interested in this uh, kind of social linguistic feature of uh, audiovisual material. 
Hence, I move, as I said, from the pure linguistic analysis of dubbing and subtitling to a more sociolinguistic approach, uh, which in my work, most, most likely, it will take the shape of uh, what Van Dijk uh, and um, uh, Holm have been talking about, which is this relationship between the language and the society at large. In this, in this perspective, it is important to, to go one step back and understand how cultural transfer, um, and actually cultural transfer studies work. Cultural transfers have occurred in all historical periods, uh, but it is possible to discern trends in, uh, in distinct periods as well, and within, within different contexts and industry too. Among seminal texts on the cultural transfer literature, I just would like to remember, if you can change slide, uh, the work of uh, Michael Expanne in 1952, Michael Varner in the 1980s, and both authors in different moments have been pointing out the connection between cultural transfer research and uh, colonial cultures as well. Um, and then, um, <clears throat> both their work further on have highlighted that in uh, transfer, um, in cultural transfer study research, the formation of cultural spaces are political in nature. And this is something that somehow intrigued and captured my attention while studying how do we read and how, do, how actually dubbing and subtitling are used, or rather what they produce. However, these cultural spaces were not treated as objective, uh, incontrovertible facts. Uh, instead, the, broad held, um, the, they, the broadly held assumption that these spaces are incontrovertible facts, which is the core, for instance, for myth formation, uh, has, been, uh, um, has been somehow context, uh, contested in cultural transfer research. So um, this extent in this, right, in this context, the approach of cultural transfer research is conceptually emancipatory and political in character, in actually at its core. And that is due to the nature of these studies that are effectively connected with the notion of the bordering, for instance, or even with the process of um, liquefaction in, uh, in Zygmunt Bauman's terms, which describe the current condition of history, the, of modernity, and in it the contemporary history as well, problematizing even further within the context, for instance, of world cinema, and, um, and, the, and the viewing of world cinema, the assumption that transfer to, drab, uh, to dubbing and subtitling should occur as close as possible to the authentic. This also shifted the, param the parameters of foreign cultural influences. The transfer of cultural references or culture mess becomes a basic technique of many European cultures that adopt the intercultural metissage. Within the remit of cultural transfer studies, research attempts to give answers to what culture, what is culture. The notion of culture employed is something that remains political at its heart and uh, varies according to sociopolitical goals as well. In the context of uh, this type of research, the debate has settled on the uh, categorization of culture as a way of uh, proceeding or modus operandi. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> Hence, taking back the debate to the Bollywood subtitling and dubbing in Europe, uh, the production of Bollywood films that undergo, um, that, uh, that Bollywood films undergo, at times even substructural, um, somehow produce what I've called in my uh, previous work uh, ad hoc films, which seems to reinstate a form of new orientalism that emerged deeply as associated with, uh, with consumption uh, and which is as demonstrated by Hagen was an expression, he used an expression called consuming India that designates the phenomenon under which India becomes a capital producer of export goods but somehow is transformed into something to accommodate local, local cultures as well. He said most of the goods are uh, tradable, 
Hagen mentions and uh, uh, transformed. Uh, um, uh, um, Hagen mentioned that uh, such products are uh, transformed and custom made for Westerners buyers or, of course, Westerner users, using a specific modus operandi. Hagen also mentioned that the goods from India have been reinvented for the Westerner consumer and consumption, which is based on a centralist construction of a fictional India. I argue this is a mediated India. Subtitled films, and even more predominantly dubbed films, have been custom made to meet the needs of a non-Hindi audience and their peripheral um, comprehension of the text. The work done on subtitling and dubbing in Bollywood uh, in Europe is, uh, is a growing phenomenon, and it is nation-based work, where language work at the different level and, uh, um, and somehow is produced by a specific nation-like operandi. While in Great Britain the consumption of Bollywood cinema happens through subtitles, in countries like, uh, like Germany, like Austria, France, and my country, Italy, um, we, um, we consume uh, Bollywood films that are being dubbed. Um, and so somehow, and to some extent, this is the way we consume India. Now, looking closely at some of these, uh, at some of these um, uh, um, texts, let's say, what emerge, um, what emerge is interesting and concerning too. So while the language of cinema is inevitably meant to produce a variety of layers of signification, which is inherently belonging to cinema language, dubbing and subtitling do work to stratify such mediation even further. Bollywood films that travel to Europe are subject to extra narrative mediation produced by the languages, of trans, um, languages or translation mode used to attune the film with the local culture. From a recent interview I conducted with, uh, you might have heard her because she's a, she's a personality, but Nazreen Munnikabir, uh, Indian-born television producer working, on, uh, working for British Channel 4 and subtitler of um, over 900 Bollywood films, revealed, that, um, uh, revealed what kind of English language is necessary to use while subtitling a Bollywood films for an international audience. Monia, the English I use is never an appropriate English, it's never an approximate English, which, which again, it's something I'm, I still have to get my head around this. But uh, um, it is the English used by the Queen, the English that large population uses. Um, it's uh, clear, correct, that translate often, not just meaning, but also nuances. As much as problematic this might seem, uh, clearly, the use of a distinctive type of English also points out a specific social agenda, specifically while pointing out that other less professional subtitles have produced subtitle text as follow. Can you go to the next? Yeah, go again. Again. And again. So if you'll be looking at the subtitle there, those are, <laughs> yeah, they have their problem, let's say. <clears throat> so, very kindly, uh, Nazreen, in, her, uh, in, in our conversation, she pointed out to a, to a website where some of the, where uh, there are some interesting uh, <laughs> subtitling, I would call it mistakes, but in massive inverted comma, because this is something that we can debate. <clears throat> so, much in the same way, dubbing is notoriously con controversial. Um, it's, a, it's a controversial way of transferring cultures, and certainly it is a way to give literally an alien voice to a character. Um, so technically, this process has been recalled revoicing, which seems to perfectly encapsulate to me this idea of new orientalism and this way of, or unique way of consuming India abroad. Um, just to give you like a brief example, but uh, um, now such practices have historically produced characterization. And again, as I said, I come from an Italian background where all, everything that comes from abroad is dubbed. So I learned my English while being in England and never by being at home through films. So um, I have memories of watching films with my mother who is here 
And the black, and I think about the black servant in Gone with the Wind. If I think about the voice that was used there, uh, she would have a specific wo uh, voice while dubbed, much different from the main protagonist in the films. So is uh, the Dalit character in Lagan, also dubbed in Italian, an abomination, but that's what we do. Um, and um, it's, a, it's, it's incredibly interesting, and, and I think this is something I would like to further investigate, this phonetic way of, of how we can create new identities which are far examples from, um, as I said, Italian voices. Um, they are just characterization that reinforce some stereotype of the foreigner in a very distinct way. So there is some, some, certainly some political agenda there which those, uh, those forms of um, dubbing and subtitling are perhaps raising. And those um, uncovered aspects is something that I would like to study further. In uh, the next year, that is the lifespan of this project, I hope to further unfold what dubbing and subtitling produce that is distinctive in cultural transfers of Bollywood cinema in Europe. How the penetration of cultural codes occur, for instance, and also are dubbing and subtitling ways of, uh, um, or rather, ways to remediate a text. Um, can we just go? Yeah. Um, certainly the modality of how the transfer occur is core to my work and specifically how the use of other voices, I, again inverted comma, um, in dubbing operates. And also what exactly is the perfect English and what does it produce beyond the mere translation of a text? Can we, for instance, talk about bridging languages that connect one culture to another? Certainly there are some practices that include bridging languages. Dubbing is one of those. Certainly there are, um, there are some um, dubbing studios that use English as this bridging language to bring Hindi into the local context. So there is a lot that needs to be done. Um, and that hopefully this, this project along with um, other colleagues will, uh, will hopefully try to answer. So both practices, dubbing and subtitling, in broad terms, open the possibility of studying them as a meaning maker beyond the original text. And it is, uh, um, and uh, in this sense, produce a variety of significations, possibly mediations between the visible and the invisible uncharted character. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. If you have a phone, please no? switch it up. Phone less. OK. Uh, yes, to go back, um, so I would like to essentially bring this thing together and see if we can have a kind of a sense um, on, to look at how um, um, subtitling and dubbing uh, can produce a variety of signification, mediation, or, or again, a new strata of information on the film between the visible and the invisible uncharted character of language. Now to end, I hope to, and this is a hope, um, but uh, I hope to shed light on the sociolinguistic implication and on the politics of cultural transfer that are dominant forces that determine new, possibly new shades of globalization of Bollywood cinema. Thank you. <laughs>